Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm Jack Nolan, joined once again by the head coach of the Fighting Irish. And Mike, tough week for your team, beginning with a missed opportunity at Syracuse, where after a nearly flawless first half that helped your Irish build a 20-point lead early in the second half, your guys just could not hold on against that Syracuse pressure. Really tough week for us, Jack, and, and that was a disappointing afternoon in Syracuse. We, As you said, we played so well in the first half. But I thought our handling of pressure and some of the quick shots we took when we did break pressure um, really cost us, and we couldn't finish it. So uh, those are tough ones uh, to bounce back from, quite frankly. And then you headed down to Louisville. You had a really good game plan, and then Louisville blows it up by hitting three threes early to take an 11-4 lead, and then they stymied your guys the rest of the way, both defensively and on the backboard little unexpected that they would shoot it that well. The numbers didn't say that, but maybe the law of averages kicked in because they had not shot it well at North Carolina. Uh, but I think their athletic ability and their ability to really guard us um, never let us make much too much of a run. We got it to five and six a couple times and then had some open looks in transition, but you got to make those uh, to escape uh, against, I think, an NSA tournament team in Louisville. Now, one guy who not only had a good week for your Irish, but is also playing the best basketball of his career right now is Juwan Durham, who just happens to be our player guest this week. Against Syracuse and Louisville, Juwan scored 28 points, made 14 of 23 shots, grabbed eight rebounds, dished out three assists, came up with two steals, and blocked four shots. Plus, he leads the ACC in conference play in field goal percentage, hitting 63.5% of his shots in league play, just ahead of Nate Leshevsky in second place at 59.3%. Is this, is this what you saw in the future for Juwan when he transferred in? Yeah, I think we knew it was going to take time. We had to get him stronger. He's not had the best of luck on the injury front. You know, he's had some injuries, but it's really neat to see, which has happened in our program, a senior down the stretch playing his best basketball. And I think he's gotten very confident. He certainly plays with a lot of good passers who find him when he rolls and he's open. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy for him to finish his senior year with some momentum and set himself up to make some money professionally next year. I am looking forward to talking with Juwan later in the show. He's a very interesting young man. Folks, our friends at NECA want to remind you that they are continuing their efforts to make our community brighter. It's what NECA electrical contractors do every day through donations, volunteer efforts, and by training the next generation of electrical workers through apprenticeship programs. The NECA contractors and electrical workers of Local 153 preparing for a brighter tomorrow. Folks, we have a heck of a show lined up for you this week. In addition to talking with Juwan Durham later in the show, Coach Bray will catch up with Notre Dame all-time great and ESPN College game day host, LaFonzo Ellis. But first, when we come back, we will break down Notre Dame's road games this week at Syracuse and Louisville. This is the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireRack.com, the ultimate in contactless tire buying. It's time now for our game breakdown, brought to you by our friends at Meyer. You started out the week Saturday at Syracuse, and in the first half at Syracuse, your guys put on a clinic about how to beat the Syracuse 2-3 zone, being patient, using good ball movement, good shooting, attacking the paint. Your guys made 11 of their first 15 shots to take a 12-point lead just over eight minutes into the game. Well, you know, that's what was so disappointing about the final result. We played so well the first 20 minutes. I've never seen a stat sheet like that at halftime where we had 15 assists uh, in 20 minutes. But you knew full court pressure was coming, and it did, and it really changed the tempo and probably the confidence of our guys when they missed a couple or turned a couple over, and we could not escape with a win in Syracuse, New York. As any conscientious coach would, that second half is burned into your brain. I know that, but I'm going to spend a little time on that first half because that was fun. And I'm going to go to a guy now who's really become your early game spark plug. Juwan Durham got off to another terrific start, scoring 10 of your first 17 points against Syracuse, including four dunks. You know, I, I just think he's playing his best basketball, Jack. We, we've had a kind of a trait in our program where 
seniors, the guys in their last year play their best basketball and it's coming down the stretch and he is really in a good frame of mind. And he's very fortunate to play with a bunch of guards who are really good passers and find him. You've also had a trait in your program of guys stepping up when other guys are injured or hobbled. And with Cormac Ryan coming back from the sprained ankle that he suffered against Miami, Trey Wirtz got the start, and boy, was he on fire early, hitting his first five shots, including four threes. Well, you, you say first game in the Carrier Dome, here's a guy who watched Syracuse play his whole life, and he starts, and he just handles it with great poise. He has really gotten comfortable now. We got him eligible, which was a surprise to him. He's gotten comfortable, uh, and he's really kind of an all-round guard for us. Can shoot it, can handle it, takes a little pressure off Prentice Hub because he can be the point guard sometimes. Nate Lyshevsky only scored three points in the first half. Teams are now directing their defensive efforts at him to take him out, but he's responding well in that he does all the other things, and he dominated the boards in the first half, grabbing 10 first-half rebounds. Well, you know, he's he is doing that. And the great thing about Nate, the reason he's shooting a high percentage is he doesn't take bad shots. And so when people take him away, he figures out, I'll help my team on the defensive end with rebounding, with helping and rotating on ball screens. I think he's handled how people have come at him since he's burst onto the scene this year with great poise. I know this is kind of like putting salt in the wound, but I want to go over those first half stats because I know you helped use or helps your team by pointing to that half about how well they had been playing. You led by 14 at the half. You shot 55% from the floor, seven of 14 from three. You scored 20 points in the paint. That's huge against the zone and 13 fast break points, only turning over the ball twice. You checked every box in how to beat Syracuse in that first half. Well, it's one of those things. It's a little bit like the Kentucky halftime. You're nervous because you know a run's coming, and you just can't play that perfect again. And can you hold them off? Well, we we did in Lexington, Kentucky. We didn't at Syracuse, New York. But there was some really beautiful basketball played. What helped was we got stops, and we could get down the floor in transition. We didn't get as many stops in the second half and then had to play against a press. But you did win that first two-minute segment. You hit three of your first four shots. You go up by 20. But then Syracuse slapped on that full court press with greater intensity and it hurt your guys. And it was a little surprising because normally your guys are really good with the ball. Changed our rhythm. And it was disappointing because, you know, we were up there in least amount of turnovers. We've been really good with it. We had a couple, maybe four guards on the floor at times. But I don't know if the turnovers hurt us as much as when we broke the press. We had some pretty good looks. You got to keep attacking. You don't want to just pull it out. And we couldn't make any of those that we made in the first half. And so now you get a little more tight and you get a little more nervous. And even their zone in the half court becomes more active than it was in the first half. The other thing is they're a gifted offensive team and we kept them down the first 20 minutes. Now they're starting to get into a rhythm and score the ball and you start to feel it coming. And it's kind of hard when it starts coming downhill on you. Try and substitute, put some different guys in, try to get them to smile in the huddle, anything to break the tension. I I couldn't really help them much as we finish the stretch. I wish I could have helped them more. Well, when it comes to this Syracuse team, Buddy Bayheim is becoming the Jerry McNamara of this team as far as Notre Dame is concerned. He had a great game. The Irish led for more than 30 minutes. They couldn't hold on, and they lose to the Irish 75-67. Everybody was ticked. You were ticked after the game. You get home. You have a couple days to practice. You bring the guys out to your house, emphasize that they're playing well. Then you head on down to Louisville against the Cardinals team that ranks 14th in the ACC in three-point shooting. They hit one of 16 from three in their previous game at Louisville. You had a good game plan for that. And, Mike, over the years, you've made me a big believer in karma. And when two Cardinal players, Dre Davis and Jalen Withers, who came into the game a combined 11 for 47 from three to hit, and then they hit their first three threes, (laughs) I'm kind of getting the sense as Louisville jumps out 11-4, it doesn't look like it's going to be your night. Yeah, it, 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 you know, they, they were one for 10 from three at North Carolina in a tough one. And, as much as all the stats say, you know, to kind of protect the paint, 
and don't let him drive and be in position to block out, you're going to give up some three-point shots. And we thought we could absorb that. But that early start and that lead that they got, we never could make a dent in it enough. It was enough to kind of give them a cushion that every time we made a run, it was too big a hole to get out of on the road. And to their credit, they made big shots, bouncing back off a tough loss. After they jumped to that 11-4 lead, you're right. That was basically, from there on till the end of the game, it was basically a wash. You played them even, but under Chris Mack, Louisville has become a very good pack line defensive team, and they defended you very well. They did. I mean, you know, they, they're really good defensively. And when we couldn't get enough in transition and had to play against their set half-court defense, they took a lot away. And they're really, really physical. Uh, and that knocked us back on our heels. Second half, we had some transition opportunities when we had it to six or seven where we got some open looks and didn't have to play against their set D. But we didn't make any of them. I think there were like six of them, and we didn't make any of them. And you got to make a couple of those to have a chance. And when you play Louisville this year, it's kind of like playing against a hybrid of Virginia and North Carolina. Louisville came in the number three rebounding team in the ACC, number two in offensive rebounding in the conference, and they controlled the boards the entire night. Well, 14 offensive rebounds was too much to absorb when you're not shooting it well enough on the other end. And, and again, I thought every possession where – we looked like maybe we had a chance to make a run. They had a putback, an athletic putback from frontline guys that have a great nose for the ball, and we just couldn't control it. Two of your guys turned in really solid efforts. One was our player guest on this show, Jawan Durham. He had one of his best games with 18 points, six rebounds, a block shot, and a steal, and he scored your first six points of the game. You know, he's playing well, Jack. You know, I, I just love the fact that down the stretch of his last year of college eligibility, it's come together. He's playing well. He plays with a bunch of guards that are really good passers and find him. And it, it, it's got to be fun being Jawan Durham when you have Hub, Ryan, Wirtz, and Goodwin finding you when you're open. Um, but uh, proud of him, the investment he made in the offseason with his body, to get stronger and more physical has really helped. Now, since you've been on campus, you've become a big Notre Dame football fan. So you know all of the focus that's on the Notre Dame football quarterback and all the blame he gets when <laughs> things don't go right. Well, the same can be said for your point guard. Right now, it's Prentice Hub. He's received a lot of criticism this year, four times playing a little out of control. But in this game, under great urgency and pressure, I thought he was as good as he's ever been. 14 points, four of eight from three, six assists, two steals, and just one turnover against that Louisville defense. Well, I think he's made some progress. And what's helped them is Jawan Durham, Nate Lashevsky, Trey Wirtz, Dane Goodwin have been more reliable on every game. And he didn't have to feel he had to take over, maybe like he did early in the season. He's done a great job with cleaning up shot selection, better shots. And I think maybe the biggest reason is he's been better defensively. He's been more responsible defensively. But uh, he's our quarterback, and he was you know, doing everything to keep us hanging around, uh, but just not quite enough. You know, Mike, right now, when you're playing Louisville, you're almost playing a hybrid between Virginia and North Carolina. Because not only do they play the pack line defense, but they also rebound really, really well. They came in as the number three rebounding team in the ACC and the number two offensive rebounding team in the conference. And they dominated the boards against you at both ends all night. Yeah, I, I love, you know, I, I knew we'd have a, a run in us to make it interesting. But as I said, the transition opportunities that we didn't get really hurt. We had open looks. And then we couldn't keep them off the backboard. We forced some misses, played some zone. We even played a little box and one on Jones. And they missed. But we couldn't get the first miss. And that you cannot absorb against Louisville. You also made a point after the game that you think against quality competition, all seven of your guys have to play well. I think you can get away with five double-figure scorers probably. But what does this team need to do? Because you got some big challenges ahead so that everybody maintains the confidence. Like when Dane Goodwin doesn't shoot, well, I think it's because he's rushing it. 
How can you get them into that confident, calm demeanor that they need to be if you can make the noise you think you can make the rest of the way? Well, it's a big week for us. There's no question coming up. And we've got three of them starting in Boston and then two at home where, you know, you can get this thing to nine and nine before you go to Greensboro. And that's what I talked to them about. That's really where we're at if we want to make a realistic run. And our guys have been really coachable and focused the whole year. I think overall the last month we played pretty well. And I don't want to lose sight of, you know, we're playing pretty well. And if you have a tough one, let's bounce back. But we certainly need to bounce back as a group in Boston. So the Irish are already in the process of working to bounce back from that 69-57 loss to the Cardinals in Louisville. We'll be back with more in the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireRack.com, right after this timeout. Hey, Notre Dame fans, Tire Rack is the presenting sponsor of the Mike Bray Show, and like the Irish, knows a thing or two about passion and performance. Their on-site test track is their home court, and they've got a playbook that includes safe, no-contact, mobile installation in many areas. Get your tires right at TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. Our player guest this week, Juwan Durham, is currently playing the best basketball of his Notre Dame career. Against Syracuse and Louisville this past week, Juwan scored 28 points, made 14 of 23 shots, grabbed eight rebounds, dished out three assists, came up with two steals, and blocked four shots. On the season, he leads the ACC in conference play in field goal percentage, hitting 63.5% of his shots in league play, ahead of Nate Leshesky, who's in second place at 59.3%. His 168 block shots in his career ranks third all-time at Notre Dame behind Jordan Cornette and LaFonso Ellis. Juwan, thanks for taking the time to join us this week on the Mike Bray Show. No problem. Thanks for having me. Now, you've scored in double figures in nine of your last 10 games. Do you agree you are playing the best basketball of your career right now? Uh, yeah, I am. I believe I am. Uh, also, st- statistically, I am. So I'm happy to be in the position I'm in right now. Well, I like that. You're a sharp guy. Stats don't always tell the whole story, but you've been passing the ball well. You and Nate worked so well together. I thought you and John Mooney worked really well together last year, but I think you and Nate worked even better together in terms of spacing, setting each other up both getting in position for rebounding. Why do you think that is? Why have you guys meshed so well on the court? Uh, well, it was really fun playing with Mooney, but uh, at the same time, I feel like me and Nate, we played it together a little longer. We had more time together to play, and uh, we just got a feel for each other's game. So uh, he knows whenever he gets it in the middle, he'll get double team because he's the type of player that uh, tracks a double team, and I'll just try to come from the baseline or wherever else I am on the court and try to uh, relieve some of the pressure for them. So uh, I think that we're we're pretty good to get on the court. What are the other factors in your playing so well right now? Uh, I just feel like it's just overall confidence and um, knowing that it's my my last raw. And uh, if I want to be able to further my basketball career, I have to be able to to show scouts that uh, I can produce. And people forget, I mean, you got hurt your junior year of high school. You missed a lot of time. You didn't play again until college, and you've been hurt throughout your college career. So when's the first time in your college career that you felt completely healthy? Uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't know if there's a time that something doesn't hurt. Uh, you always have little knick, knick-knack pains that, uh, that goes on, but uh, it's just playing through it. Like, if it's not – my knee being sore one day, it'll be my shoulders a little sore. If it's not my shoulders, it's my fingers. So it's, it's always something that's going to be there, but you just play through it and uh, come game time, you're not really thinking about it. Your adrenaline's pumping. You're just ready to play and try to go out and get a win. And it's not just your play per se. It's your leadership. What was your reaction when you found out you'd be one of the Notre Dame captains this season? Uh, it was really an honor to have. Uh, I remember when I first came in, you had a, uh, Leaders like Matt um, Bonzi and, uh, and Marty Gebman. And it just it's pretty cool to be in the same shoes as those guys, as someone that uh, the rest of the team looks up to and someone that they can uh, rely on when things get tough. Do you think the experience you've had as a leader of this team is going to help you down the road, not just in your basketball career, but whatever comes after that? 
Yeah, uh, like I always said, um, I love Notre Dame because it always uh, helps you out with life after basketball. And I just feel like being able to lead the way that, I, that I've been able to and uh, just the, com- the comfortability that I have with, uh, with meeting new people and things like that, it'll help me out in, my long, in the long run. Of course, and that's a good segue into this next question. You were playing at UConn. You liked UConn, but it just wasn't the right fit. So you decided to come to Notre Dame. But I mean, coming out of high school, you were a top 60 player nationally. Lots of programs came after you. Syracuse, Florida, Florida State, Indiana, Kansas, NC State. The list goes on and on. Why do you think Notre Dame turned out to be the best fit for you? Uh, as I said, I uh, just felt like it would be a spot that I can uh, focus in at it and uh, somewhere that uh, I can feel at home. Um, as you know, I'm from Florida, so I'm not really the one that's going to be outside much during uh, the winter. So I'm, I'm just shacked up inside or I'm inside of the gym. And uh, I just really like the culture that Notre Dame had here. Uh, I like that the guys were really close in it. Uh, we saw them as like a family. And uh, I just I just like the, the chemistry that they had on the court. And I like the, uh, the chemistry off the court as well. And the coaching staff is phenomenal. They're, they make sure you're good. Uh, I know, uh, well, I didn't know at the time being, but uh, Coach Hump is one of the guys that just, he, he's always there for you. I remember once in the game, I got hurt a little bit. I think I like twitched my ankle or something. And soon as it happened, he called my mom to like let her know everything was fine. And she hits me up and I'm like, how do you even know that I'm, I'm hurting right now? And uh, that just just shows a testament of how much they care about you here. And uh, something I really liked about coming here. So it sounds like Notre Dame has certainly met your expectations. Has Notre Dame exceeded them at all? Oh, definitely. It definitely have exceeded them. Uh, it just, it just somewhere that, like I said, somewhere that you feel like is home and uh, they really do a good job of making you feel comfortable. Getting back to your play on the court, what does it mean to you that you have the best shooting percentage by far of any ACC player in conference games. And it's not just people say, well, he's a big guy. He's just dunking. No, your jump hooks, your, your step back jumpers, you've been scoring from all around the paint to have this kind of success in this league. Has it surprised you at all? Uh, To be honest with you, I did not know that I was leading until you just said that, but, uh, um, I, I'm not really surprised. Uh, it just goes to, to show the testament of the work that I'm putting in. And um, I'm just uh, humble and grateful to be in the position that I'm in. And uh, hopefully I can do more to help our team win. Now, we talked about how you and Nate are working well together. And that's a, a difficult dynamic to work out between two big guys. You're supposed to work well to a degree with your guards and your point guard. But, boy, you and Prentice Hub have really been in sync. You've run the pick and roll as well this year as any guard big guy combination I can remember. How much work has gone into that? A lot. Like I said, with Nate, me and uh, Prentice have playing together for a while now, and uh, we really uh, understand how each other likes to play. We got a feel for each other's game. So uh, sometimes we don't even have to look at each other. Like I can just see the way that he's running up the court. I can see what he's looking for, and I know that he'll want to screen early, so I try to set him an early screen, and he just rewards me by passing the ball and vice versa, by catching the post, I know that uh, I can find them drifting along the three-point line for a shot. So we just, we just learn how, we just learn each other's game. And uh, I'm just grateful to have a point guard like him that's, that doesn't mind on passing the ball. Well, he's a great passer, but so are you. You're among the best passing big men I've ever seen. Where did that come from? Uh, just having a feel for the game. Uh, I know that if I'm doing well on offense, I'm going to attract double team when everybody's going to look at me to go into the paint. So I know if I make a quick move or something, I can dish it out to one of the guards on the wing. And the way that our guards shoot the ball, it's always an easy job for me to do. Now you're now third all time at Notre Dame in block shots. Do you have a strategy when you go up to block a shot, a goal beyond just blocking that shot? Uh, to be honest with you, no, not really. I just try to protect the basket and stay in the game, honestly. Uh, I know sometimes it's a little difficult because I can catch a foul really easily in, in our league. But uh, I just try to just time it a little bit and uh, just go up and I make sure that the guard thinks that they have the layup and secured. And I'm just like, nah, let me get that, buddy. 
I, I was going for a Bill Russell type of block. Now you're too young. I don't know if you've even ever heard of Bill Russell. He was a great player and center for the Boston Celtics. Celtics. He, yep. So you've heard of him? Oh, of course I have. He was famous for keeping the ball alive, for not just blocking the ball, but getting it to a teammate. And I found very rarely do you swat it into the stands, even though you could, you do often keep it in play. And there's even occasional times where you start a break with it. So I was wondering if that's a conscious process or just something that comes naturally to you. Uh, yeah, that is. I'm pretty conscious of that. Um, uh, sometimes if I do get a block, uh, I try to tell myself I want to like just like uh, palm the ball instead of blocking it. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. So just try to pat it into to, uh, one of our defenders' hands and um, just try to be smart and conscious of it. There's a lot of big guys playing in the post in this league. Al McGuire used to call them aircraft carriers. Other call them wide bodies. One thing you've done really well at this year that I think you've stepped up your game at is rebounding. There were times in the past when I know you didn't grab as many rebounds as you wanted to, but that doesn't happen as much anymore. What's changed to help you be a more productive rebound? Uh, just being in the right place at the right time, honestly, and uh, it's all about effort. And I feel like I can do a, a little better job than what I'm doing now. It's just me being a tough critic on myself. But uh, like you said, it just – well, like I said, um, it's just being in the right place at the right time and uh, uh, trying to boss out your man before the shot goes up. Now, you are now in grad school. You graduated in May with your undergraduate degree in film, television, and theater. Is it true that you never received a grade lower than a B in any of your undergraduate classes at Notre Dame? Yes, that is true. Okay, and you're a Division I athlete. Talk to me about that juggling act and that focus that you never let, you never got a C, which is passing, which is average. You always got a good grade in every class. How hard was that to accomplish? Uh, it's definitely tough given the workload and the schedule that we have, but uh, I've, I've been doing this for a while now from high school to now, and um, I'm just, I'm used to it. I, I went to a really good high school that prepared me well for uh, academics and um, playing basketball. I've been balancing that for a while. And it's just the same thing once I got into college. Of course, the, the workload is a little, a little tougher, but uh, you just got to, when life gives you lemon, you make lemonade, right? So you just got to take, just do what you got to do and go on to the next. Well, we are certainly happy with uh, all of the assistance and molding that Tampa Prep did for you to make you the person you are today and the great contributor here at Notre Dame. Now, that degree in film, television, and theater, how do you think that's going to help you down the road? Uh, I think it can help me out a lot going into uh, to broadcasting and things like that. And uh, also, I wouldn't mind like, getting to production part of the, the film. So I really like uh, to watch a lot of movies and um I like the, the the layout of making films and like the, the process that goes into it. So hopefully somewhere down the line, I can uh, get into the film industry. Now you are, the, you're the oldest in your family, four younger sisters, a younger brother. Uh, you told me earlier that they're not as involved in sports as you've been throughout your life. Yeah. Well, we've kind of had a different upbringing. Um, Growing up, I was always the, the only child, so they uh, my parents had to keep me busy somehow other than just going to school. So uh, sports was my safe haven for me. But uh, with my younger siblings, they all have each other, and they're all hanging out. And uh, a lot of them are, like, into more, like, school. And uh, one of my sisters, she's really big on art. So they're, they're still getting a feel for themselves and who they are growing up. And hopefully down the line, they, they might fall into sports. But if not... It is what it is. Well, you've certainly proven that you're in the school as well. You wouldn't have done as well at Notre Dame as you have or at Tampa Prep. So what do you think you've learned during your college years that you can pass on to your siblings? Uh, time management uh, is going to be tough. Uh, given if they don't play sports, they have a lot of time on their hands and that can just lead to just fooling around. But hopefully they're smart enough to just be able to to do what they need to do when they need to do it. And, uh, and hopefully that they are ready to get away from home 
as far as in going to school out of state because that would be a different to them that a lot of my siblings are used to just staying at home. So it would be interesting to see where they lead up. What's been your best memory so far at Notre Dame? Uh, best memory at Notre Dame. Probably have to say uh, just just meeting new people and uh, hanging out with friends. Uh, something that I, I've always liked to do was uh, the tailgates. The football tailgates were always fun. Um, just going out, meeting new fans and new people, and uh, everyone having high expectations for us uh, throughout the season. And just going out and cheering for the football team. Like, that's the one time that you get to just be actually a, a fan and you get to be a student and just have fun with everyone else. Now, senior night's coming up, and it's going to be weird um, because of the pandemic. I don't, is your family coming in for that? Are they even allowed to come in for that? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, my, I spoke with my mom about it. Uh, she's up to date on COVID protocol and everything, so she'll be here. And I believe my dad's coming, too. He's up to date with everything as well. So uh, looking forward to seeing them if they can come. So what are they more proud of? what you've done on the court or what you've done in the classroom, or is it equal? Uh, I feel like they always favor school a little bit more, <laughs> and um, rightfully so. Uh, they're, they're really proud of me of what I've done on the court, but they're more so glad that uh, I was able to get a degree from a prestigious university like Notre Dame. Um, uh, I think I might be the first person in my family, and especially my immediate family, to go off to school and uh, get a degree. So they're really proud of me about that. And they should be. Congratulations. And now you get, for the final time, to run the Notre Dame basketball verbal fast break. Yes, sir. Favorite all-time movie? Favorite all-time movie would have to be uh, More Than a Game, LeBron James. Okay. First car you ever drove? First car I ever drove was a... A Nissan Altima. Okay. I'm driving a Maxima now. Okay. Favorite musical group or artist? Uh, favorite artist is J. Cole and uh, probably Kendrick Lamar. Those two go back and forth with. Who was your role model? Uh, my role model growing up was my mom and my dad. One thing the public would be surprised to learn about you? Uh. I can occasionally draw. I say occasionally because uh, I start for a while, then I stop for a long time, and then I'll get back into it. So uh, depending on the day, if I'm a good artist or not. Favorite NBA player? LeBron James. Favorite thing to do in relaxing? Sleep. Favorite sport to play other than basketball? Football. Favorite part of practice? Um, ice bath. Worst part of practice? Ice bath. <laughs> Best part of your game? Uh, shot blocking. Part of your game you still need to work on? Uh, taking people off the dribble. City or place in the world you would like to visit? Uh, I want to go to Santorini, Greece. Ooh, I've been there. Good place to go. Which is better, a highlight film dunk, blocking a key shot, or grabbing a big rebound? Probably blocking a big shot. One thing you always hear from Coach Bray in practice. Stay the course. Uh, yeah, he says stay the course a lot, and he also says uh, uh, that's one win. Let's keep him going. Assistant coach who is most like Coach Bray. Uh, you got to go, Coach B. You got to yeah. say belongs. Just a one or two word answer describing the other guys on the staff. Scott Martin. Uh, sorry, I'm not fast with this at all. Uh, team player. Ryan. Say team player. Okay. That no, that's good. Oh, I say team player because uh, he's always there to help out whenever we need him. 
Ryan Humphrey. Uh, big bro. Harold Swanigan. Swanee. That's the first thing that comes to mind. I think it's Swan. Toughest place to play in the ACC. Um, probably Virginia. Player on the team is most like you. I'm one of a kind. I don't think anyone's like me. <laughs> <laughs> Toughest Notre Dame player to guard. I would say Matt Zona because he hooks <laughs> so much. It's, it's just ridiculous how much he hooks me. How he makes him possible. Best defender on the team? Uh, probably Cormac. Best leaper on the team? Tony. Best dunker on the team? I could say myself. Worst dunker on the team? Um, probably Elijah Morgan. Be Best dresser on the team? Uh, I say Elijah, oh, not Burns, uh, Elijah Taylor. Worst dresser on the team? Um, probably Matt or Tony. They probably tie the worst. This is our ninth show, so I've kind of learned this is not a team full of singers. But uh -huh. who is the best singer on the team? Uh, I'm going to stick with my answer from last year. I'm going to say myself. Okay. Worst singer on the team? Um, probably Nick Jogo. Best comedian on the team? Uh, probably Tony. Guy who thinks he's funny, but really isn't. Uh. Say, uh, say, Nick. <laughs> Free throw shooting competition. Who wins? You or Coach Bray? I got to go with myself, of course. Absolutely, John. Thank you. It's been great to call your games. Good luck the rest of the season and beyond. No problem. Thank you very much. We will return to wrap up this week's Mike Bray Show, presented by Tyrac.com. Right after this timeout. Lafonso Ellis remains one of the most charismatic, intense, and talented basketball players in Notre Dame history. Ellis averaged a double-double for his career at Notre Dame, 15.5 points and 11.1 rebounds. He is the only Notre Dame player to lead the team in block shots in each of his four seasons. Despite missing 27 games during his Irish career, Fon still ranks second on Notre Dame's all-time block shots list with 200, fourth on Notre Dame's all-time rebounding list with 1,075, and 17th on Notre Dame's all-time scoring list with 1,505 points. He was named a member of the 25-man Notre Dame All-Century team in 2004. Ellis graduated from Notre Dame with a degree in accounting in 1992. The Denver Nuggets made Ellis the fifth overall selection in the first round of the 1992 NBA draft, and Ellis went on to play 624 NBA games with 359 starts during 11 NBA seasons for the Nuggets, Hawks, Timberwolves, and Heat. Ellis made the NBA All-Rookie Team and twice won the NBA Sportsmanship Award. Lafonso began his broadcasting career in 2006 when he joined me on the Notre Dame Basketball Radio Network. He moved on and up to ESPN in 2009 and is now one of the hosts of ESPN's College Game Day. Lafonso Ellis did not play for Mike Bray, but the two have become good friends during Coach Bray's 21 years at Notre Dame. Earlier today, Coach Bray caught up with the Fonz. Lafonso Ellis, my neighbor, my neighbor. Great to have you with us. And I love the monogram jacket. How you doing? Catch us up with uh, what's going on with you, even though we see you a lot on ESPN. Yeah, no, doing well, Coach. Um, as I was saying to you off air, my schedule has been I work Fridays doing that Bald Mental Campus show for the ACC Network. Uh, college game day and studio on Saturday, studio Sunday, studio Monday, Tuesday, typically home on Wednesday. Uh, Jennifer, my wife, and I referred to that as a rotation. And so the last four rotations have been done from home prior to starting November 23rd. I've been commuting back and forth between here and Bristol, which is great, too. Well, I tell you one thing, you have just taken off every time I turn ESPN college basketball on. 
you're on and and you've done a great job and we're so darn proud of you here okay. you thank mentioned you. jennifer thank you and i was telling jack mm -hmm. nolan before you joined us jennifer walter and i all have the same pilates <laughs> and it's the, secret, uh, yes. it's the secret for us staying in shape but let me talk about yes. walter a little bit i'm watching bucknell mm -hmm. i'm following him he's having a heck of a year and so are they tell us a little bit about walter's year yeah uh, mike they started out they decided to do a conference only schedule and uh, that was going to be 16 games uh our best player uh, ended up getting into concussion protocol two days before the season began. And so we started off limping, lost our first four games, and then he came back. We won our last four, and Walter was the reigning three-point field goal champion of the Patriot League uh, in terms of field goal percentage. Couldn't buy a basket. <laughs> now, rumors of him being uh, uh, on the all-defensive team, but couldn't buy a basket. But then over the last four games, I think he was, what, 8 of 12 from three, so he's starting to find it. And then, sadly, Coach, soon as he starts to find it, team starts to come together. We go into a 14-day quarantine, oh. by which they just got out. Uh, a week, a week ago Thursday. So it, it's, just, this, <laughs> it's just been a mess. Just well, been a mess. But we're 4-4 four 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 right now. How many oh. games? Mm -hmm. The one thing about him seeing him this summer and pass and talking to him after we worked out, he is becoming a man now. That body is starting to fill out sure. and he looks the part and he's found just a great niche at Bucknell with a great school sure. and being a key guy. And that that, you know, that is just just so important. Um, you know, Jack, before you came on, we were talking a little bit about your career and your numbers here and your your NBA numbers. But as, what's been so neat, Fonz, is you've always kind of made this place home, even though you've traveled and played other places. This is sure. kind of South Bend has always been home base for you. And I know Jennifer's family is a is a South Bend family. Sure. And um, but I, I know the people mm -hmm. here in town just love having you around uh, in the off season, especially. Well, I love being here, Mike. This, um, you know, I had a unique experience at Notre Dame. You know, academically, it wasn't easy to get that accounting degree, academically ineligible twice. And uh, because my best friend lived on the north side of town, my barbershop was on the west side of town, and my girlfriend, now wife, lived on the east side of town. I kind of knew South Bend like the back of my hand. And because I was out and at Martins and places like that, while I was in school, I had a unique connection that maybe not many of the athletes who go to Notre Dame do. And so because of that deep connection, when I would be at Martin's or at the car wash, uh, the folks in South Bend were so encouraging and, and positive and telling me you can do it. Uh, I, you know, you don't forget those things, Mike, especially when you're in a place of struggle, right? And so South Bend's always had a special place in my heart. I never knew, I didn't think we would move back so soon, but we ended up moving back 14 years ago and uh, we've, best friend lives in Austin. Uh, another buddy of mine at ESPN lives down in Florida. They've been trying to get us to go there. South Bend works for us, man. And I'm so grateful to be part of this community so many years later that were so good to me during my four years at Notre Dame. One of the things we do miss is because of this pandemic, you've not been able to hang around the practice facility and talk to our players. And I so appreciate the role model and the coaching and the mentoring uh, that you've done. And then we're going to get back to that as soon as we get to <laughs> herd immunity or whatever we need <laughs> sure. to get to. Yeah. We're going to get back to having you around our, our players more. But I did tell Jack, I said, I remember – Oh, early in my career, you know, you were thinking about coaching a little bit. And sure. and, I, and and, and uh, I, I remember one time you said to me, Coach, you kind of talked me out of it. You were kind of <laughs> protecting me, weren't you? <laughs> I, said, I said, wait a minute, really think about this before you go down that road. And uh, my God, you, you've, you've carved out a great niche on television. You know, be patient with us because we've got to get you up in that ring of honor. And this pandemic oh, no. is... Oh, okay. oh, <laughs> no, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not worthy of that one. So many guys have contributed uh, to our great basket, men's basketball program over the years that are so much more worthy than, than I, Mike. And uh, again, I'm just I'm grateful to you that you've always made me feel part of the ND program. I know you didn't coach me, but uh, you would never know that 
in the way that you both treated me and my family. And I'm very grateful for that. Well, my, my gosh, I could use you now if you had any eligibility. <laughs> have a whole lot of discussion this this summer at 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 one of our favorite places here in town. But uh, talk a little bit about your teammates and your Notre Dame basketball experience. You know, again, I I wasn't fortunate enough to coach you, but you did have a great experience, and I know how close you are with those guys you played with back in the nineties. Yeah, no, uh, we, we all still chat a lot <laughs> today. Thank God for uh, social media and uh, texting to be able to stay connected. Uh, Joe Frederick, Jameer Jackson, Scott Paddock, Keith Robinson. Those were the older guys when I came to school. And uh, wow, uh, I'm so deeply indebted to those guys because of how they were just generous dudes, Mike. Uh, you know where I'm from, from East St. Louis, Illinois. I uh, come from an impoverished home, uh, didn't have vehicles, cash, et cetera. And yet uh, those guys really took care of me and made me feel like I was part of their family. And so every time I get a chance to chat with them, I always try to thank them for um, just that sense of brotherhood that they allowed me to feel while I was there. And uh, of course, M- uh, Monty Williams, Elmer Bennett, Damon Sweet, Keith Tower, Billy Taylor, those oh. guys, uh, man, they're 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 very dear to me. And then that freshman group that was behind them, the Ross twins, Brooks Boyer, Carl Cozen, all of those guys, we all stay connected. And uh, you know, when you get when you bring recruited, uh, coaches sell you on relationships for a lifetime. And you know, at that age, at 17, 18 years of age, you're like, whatever. <laughs> right, but then on right. the other side. Of it. In my 51st, 51st year, uh, it, it, it is very real, Mike, and those guys are very intentional about reaching out. If there's tragedy or something that's going wrong in your family, my wife, of course, has had health issues. Those dudes are always reaching out and uh, being a source of encouragement at that level. And so uh, the men's basketball program then and now are so dear to me. And so I'm grateful to have forge those relationships back then that have survived even over the 30 plus years that I've been out of school now. You know, the, the one thing about our basketball family and you and I have talked about it. Um, and of course this pandemic has slowed up the reunions that sure. we've been having. It's been so neat to have all the guys back regularly. We've tried to do them every other year and get them all back. And yeah. we always have great attendance. And for me, it's a, <laughs> it's a history lesson to see sure. your nucleus of guys. And then, you know, and, and then Collis Jones and his guys over there and and go around and bounce around and just hear the stories. So our goal is to do that again this fall when we come out of this thing and 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 get everybody back around because it, it truly is a, a, a group that takes care of its own. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and in speaking of that, Mike, and so we've talked about it from a basketball standpoint, but even those who are around the basketball program, the Jack Nolans of the world who, you know, you, you guys gave me the opportunity back in 2006 when it looked like we were going to be moving to town to uh, start my little radio broadcast career. And uh, I still remember Jack going, dude, you're only going to be with us for a short while because ESPN isn't going to come looking for you. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm here with you, bro. And uh, within a year or so, uh, that actually happened. And Jack was so influential with taking me away and spending some time with me to actually do a little couple of little TV little sets on the side where we would call a couple games together. And you talk about that generosity and that, uh, sense of uh, brotherhood and belonging in our Notre Dame program. And even on that periphery, as we start to get into broadcasters and that, uh, the, no, no one more meaningful to me at that level than Jack Nolan. We were blessed to have you as our radio guy. I loved having you around and picking your brain. And as I said, talking to our big guys and kind of mentoring them a little bit. We're going to get back to that this summer. Um, and and Walter, <laughs> Walter, Walter's going to be able to get back over here and play pickup with our guys. We missed all of <laughs> he this, enjoyed that. you know, this past summer. <laughs> but um, in signing off, I want you to know we're so darn proud of you. We so you. appreciate you. And I miss you, even though I know you haven't left town and you're right down the road from me. I just haven't been able to see you. But we're going to catch up as soon as this season ends. I look forward to it, Mike. Thank you so much for having me.
Welcome back to the Mike Bray Show. One road game left on the regular season schedule against longtime rival Boston College at two Saturday afternoon. A rematch with a BC team you beat 870 back in January and a BC team that will be coming off a two-week COVID-19 pause. Well, it, it, they're kind of hard to wrap their arm. Who are they? You know, it's a new coach. They've lost a key player. But I would say we better be ready for a very inspired group. They're back. They've got a new voice leading them. They've got nothing to lose. And every time we seem to play Boston College, even though we've won most of them, they're usually great games, especially in Chestnut Hill. Then you get to wrap up the regular season with a couple of home games, beginning with a Wednesday night matchup with an NC State team with a lot of size and athleticism. Well, NC State playing well here down the stretch, and it could be a quality win for us, a quad two win, which could help a potential resume if we continue to do more work with Florida State and then in the ACC tournament. But NC State, like Louisville, very athletic group. Can we keep them off the offensive board? Mike, as always, thank you and good luck this week. Thank you. The Mike Gray Show will return at this time next week to break down all the action from the Boston College and North Carolina State games and preview the season finale with Florida State and the upcoming ACC tournament. Until then, for Coach Bray, I'm Jack Nolan. Thanks so much for tuning in. Stay safe, everybody, and as always, go Irish.